Greetings, unsettled souls. Welcome to the Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGange doing commentary for the Media Speaks here. About the set, I want to give a shout out to, uh, to Angela and Mike and some of our other people who have kindly donated to us. Because as you can see, especially on high def, not so much low def. Hello, low def. Hello, high def. Um, we got the uh, we got a new desk. The new computer desk is up, so everything can be a little more uh, conveniently arranged. The graphics, as you can see, will be coming back. Um, we, we're having a problem getting the right extensions to plug into the right things to go into the, the widgets that go into the have-nots and the haves. But we're going to get it, and it's all going to work. And as always, that's your update, and that's not, not why most of you tuned in. Most of you tuned in, actually, to hear about the news. And uh, actually, I'm glad she's up here. She's usually in the other room monitoring uh, things. But I would like to say, this is, Christelle, the story that's going to scare you the most. Because what are the two things you love even more than me? Cigarettes and cell phones. Yes, indeed. They found a way, Christelle, to take your phone away from you without poisoning you with nuclear radiation. That way, when they take your phone and you want to kill yourself, or you, it used to be that when they took your phone away and you wanted to just die from it, you were probably going to because of the fallout. Christelle, they found a way to take your phone away without any nuclear radiation. Wow. Yeah. See, I, I'm telling you, you know, she didn't argue. It's it's cigarettes, phone, and me in that order. I'm sure of it. Um, this is fool.com. This was uh, maybe maybe cell phone, cigarettes, you. Oh, the cell. See, oh, this is even worse news for you then. This is by Rich Smith. Uh, Christelle is giving you the worst news ever. And keep in mind, I'm not kidding, friends. I'm really not. Born into, genera Born into Generation X, I grew up with the threat of nuclear war and all of its calories, uh, the, uh, the author writes. From visions of mushroom clouds to duck and cover drills in high school to Terminator movies, and of course the ever-present worry that one day a sneaky Soviet satellite would detonate way up in the sky and fry all of our electronics with an electromagnetic pulse. We've covered it frequently on this show. It says, so imagine my surprise when the U.S. Air Force confirmed last week that it's developed an electromagnetic pulse weapon of its own and that Boeing is helping to build it. Christelle, that means there's a very good likelihood that it is going to work. This could be, you, you one day, she's going to follow, you're going to hear this thud. One day your cell phone may shut off and never come back on. Well, that means that your computer would be dead too. That's fine, because I don't think I have any listeners anyway. If I do, leave a comment. Uh, listen to this. A oh, champion... Oh, hundreds. Yes. Yeah, at least in theory. If, if anybody's, like, just clicking them to make them rise, don't do that, by the way. YouTube never knows what's going on. It says, the weapon in question, Boeing's champ, short of counter-electronics, high-powered microwave advanced missile project. It's essentially the old nuclear, electro nuclear electromagnetic pulse. I sounded like George Bush that we used to worry about so much, but without the nuclear part. In other words, are you realizing, all jokes aside, what this can do? If we know that a, a an area in the city, for instance, has... Uh, ISIS loves to do this. ISIS and Al-Qaeda like to hide their weapons in the middle of the city so that when you take the weapons out, you end up destroying all the civilians in the process, and then they can talk about how bad the Jews are because they hid weapons in the middle of a city and the Jews took it out. This will eliminate that. Yeah, you know, they said the drones were going to be uh, uh, accurate, and usually they hit civilians in the process of taking out the enemy. Well, with this, the worst you're going to do is pretty much take out the civilian's microwave. You're not really going to kill the civilian when you kill the enemy's hidden weaponry, which is in the city just to make you attack the civilians and make you look bad. They did this all the way back to the uh, Vietnam War. Where it says the weapon in question, it's called Boeing's Champ, and it says um, it carries a small generator that emits microwaves to fry electronics with pinpoint accuracy. It targets not nations or cities, but individual buildings. Blacking out their electronics rather than blowing up physical targets or people. This could be a way to win a war. And, again, if you did this to Russia, they might go nuclear on you for the sole purpose of uh, the fact that you just won otherwise. But if the country isn't nuclear, this is a great way to win a war and to eliminate 
things like ISIS rather quickly. They can steal everything they want to. We'll just shut it down with a beam. Um, it almost sounds too good to be true. I'm telling you, I'm wondering if the beam itself is horribly carcinogenic. Is that even possible? My point being, it, it seems damn near too good to be true. God willing, it isn't. It says, what makes CHAMP even more interesting is that unlike a nuclear electromagnetic pulse weapon, which fires once, blacking out entire nation states, CHAMP can fire multiple times, pinpointing the blacking out of only essential targets. This would permit, example, taking down radar defenses in a hostile state, while saving the electrical grid that supports the civil population. In other words, they won't be freezing to death. In a 2012 test flight in Utah, a single champ was reported to have blacked out seven separate targets in succession in one single mission. Now again, how, how deeply do you need to bury something to prevent this from getting to it, and why aren't we doing it with major portions of our infrastructure? Because if we can do it, you can bet the Ruskies and other people can do it. It said uh, a Boeing representative was able to boast uh, a while back that uh, we hit every target we wanted to, predicting further that in the, in the future, near future, this technology may be used to render an enemy's electronic and data systems useless even before the first troops or aircraft arrive. Three years later, that future has arrived. So um, Boeing makes it, again, it's a uh, $19 trillion industry that could destroy the Internet. And, uh, you know, again, it could, it could send you into the Dark Ages if an EMP went off. But a non-nuclear EMP is at least something that you can do to the enemy that is not uh, poisoning them. It's not putting cancers into their body. And it's not killing innocent people. If this goes wrong, uh, you've messed up somebody's microwave, not their lives. Uh, so I'll be interested to see if this is as promising as it could be. But uh, uh, the more of a pacifist you are, or at least in theory that you are, the better this sounds. Uh, this is also interesting. Uh, DC Eno, INNO had this posted May 25th, 2015. Happy Memorial Day. Uh, and if such a thing can be happy, thank you for serving. DARPA will start testing laser cannons to shoot missiles out of the sky. It says uh, DARPA is going to start shooting missiles and rockets out of the sky with laser beams when it tests the high energy liquid laser area defense system this summer. White Sands Missile Range, it's going to be done at the uh, White Sands Missile Range. The agency has been working on improving the strength and portability of its lasers so that H-E-L-L-A-D-S HELADS can be used to blow up incoming mortars, aircraft missiles, or anything else in the sky. Now it's ready for field testing. I'm not against this. Obviously, everything that's in the military lately has been used against us. I'm against using military weapons against the civilian population as a libertarian and as a constitutionalist. Yes, we agree. I'm saying that this is the kind of weaponry, though, you're going to want. For, uh, for instance, Russia has been enjoying invading the airspace of other people's country for the last six months. And you can argue that they're doing it because we deserve it. You could be arguing that they do it because they're being aggressors. You know what? It doesn't matter. I don't care if we deserve it or not. I don't want foreign planes over our country, and I'm very happy that we have ways to shoot down missiles that could also be over our country and landing on our people. So while I know that DARPA is no friend of the Fourth Amendment and no friend of posse comitatus, which prevents a standing army uh, in the country according to the Constitution, I am in favor of the country creating things that could quite likely save millions of lives, and uh, this is one such device. It says, the technical hurdles, hurdles were daunting, but it's extremely gratifying to have developed a new type of solid-state laser with unprecedented power and beam quality for its size, said uh, DARPA programmer Rich Bagnell in a statement. The Halad's laser is now ready to be put on the test, testing range against some of the toughest technical threats our warfighters face, which is good. Good. Less rocketry raining down on uh, Americans. And if it's used for that, it looks like a very defensive weapon. Defensive weapons are always good. If the field test goes well, it could move into operational use soon after. That won't be till the end of the program, though. A similar laser could someday be attached to military aircraft as well. 
and a program to stop missiles, I'm sure, coming at the aircraft. Interesting. I mean, these are interesting things that we are talking about here on the uh, Correct Views today. And uh, I'm going to get into two weed stories here. This is brought to you by Mike McLaughlin, M-A-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. Look up Mike McLaughlin on Facebook.com for some of the best fiction, poetry, and political rants that you have ever, ever, ever read, Mike McLaughlin. Listen to this. California bill proposes new on-the-spot drug test devices for cops. State moves to clamp down on driving under the influence of marijuana. This is going to be another one of those ridiculous uh, DUI things. This was dated uh, 421, no less. Um, the DUI laws, as they stand right now, are ridiculous. First of all, and I'm going to be very clear with this, you are no more danger as a person my size having two drinks on the road than you are of having no drinks. It has no effect on you at all. It does not. It's a lie given to you by the government. What they do is they'll show you someone driving a car when they're drunk and they'll tell you how bad it is. That's a simulated car. By that I mean the steering has been skewed to deliberately show what you're like on two drinks. That's not what anybody's like on two drinks. The reason that they do this, and that's why they have three tiers, because it's really only the high point of the second and the third tier that was ever a danger to anybody on the road. Um, they do this as an excuse to rake in money for the state government and the cities. and the inf it's, it's how they raise money, by uh, fleecing the public. Now they're getting ready to do it with weed. And uh, regular weed smokers are not going to be the least bit impaired. And again, if, if someone who smokes a joint gets in a wreck and they're a regular weed smoker, I would argue they would have gotten in that wreck under the exact same circumstances even if they had not smoked weed. Yes, I will stand by that. It says a bill moving through California, of course, anything that Uber Alice has a hand in there, Mr. Uh, Jerry Brown, legislature would equip police with devices enabling them to conduct instant drug tests on motorists to determine whether they're driving under the influence of marijuana. Yeah, because that's in accordance with the Fourth Amendment. But you bent over and you took it up the ass, didn't you, for the, for the good of, uh, of uh, drunk driving. It's for the children, and now it's an out-of-control beast, isn't it? They're getting ready to do it again. Assembly Bill 1356 would allow local law enforcement to take oral swabs in addition to or in place of blood or breath tests if a person is arrested for driving under the influence of drugs. And of course what that would do is make another database where people can steal the DNA of anybody that they want to. So even when you have DNA uh, opening up your computer, oh I give a little, a little poke in the finger and put some DNA in this and it'll, it'll let me in my computer. That'll be so cool. Now, anybody would be able to get your DNA. I mean, if Anonymous can do it, anyone can do it. It says, the bill sponsor, and I don't think Anonymous would be the ones to do it. The bill sponsor, Assemblyman Tom Lackey, Republican Palmdale, showed off the Allure DDS R2 at a press conference yesterday, a portable device he hopes will soon have the hands and officers across the state. The device, hailed as the wave of the future, would enable police to test saliva for the presence of marijuana, cocaine, Xanax, and methamphetamine while providing almost instantaneous results. And then you're going to get into when it was taken and to what concentrations it's in for. This is going to be another step towards big government. This is going to be another step towards the elimination of our freedom and our rights as we know them and an excuse to give people tickets who were a no threat being on the road whatsoever and another excuse as a revenue generation device for the state. I hope I'm being very clear here. It says, an impaired driver, I would completely support not driving, Lynette Davy said. However, this is just another way of having zero tolerance for people with THC in their system just to make them criminalized. And that is absolutely true in every way. It says, I think that people want to have a clear-cut black and white solution. No, I think the only people that are looking for something like that is someone who's trying to raise money for the state. Friends, if you want to know someone that's on the right side of this here at... Uh, Four in 15 seconds, soon to be 4.20 in the morning. Actor Morgan Freeman makes passionate case for medical marijuana legalization. Ow. Eat it, drink it, smoke it, and snort it, Morgan claims. Well, I'm not with him on the snorting. <laughs> I'm not going to say I've never tried weed, not going to say I never smoked it. 
am going to say publicly I've never snorted marijuana, and nor do I have any plans to do so. But, uh, hey, Morgan Freeman, I'm not going to argue with him. Critically acclaimed actor, Morgan Freeman has lent his celebrity to the cause of medical marijuana legalization. In an interview with the Daily Beast, the Shawshank Redemption star revealed that he relied on marijuana to ease his pain after he was injured in a car wreck. My wife got me into it many years ago, Freeman divulged. Oh, blaming the old wife there, it's the Adam and Eve approach. It says, how do I take it? However it comes, I'll eat it, drink it, smoke it, and snort it, Freeman said. This movement is really a long time coming, and it's getting legs, uh, longer legs. Now the thrust is understanding that alcohol has no real medicinal value. Maybe if you have one drink, it'll quiet you down, but two or three and you're fucked, he said. Well, I don't know if that's completely true. Again, that depends on your tolerance. Weed, get in my belly, the actor reportedly added. The Academy Award-winning Dark Knight actor explained how marijuana, a Schedule One substance under federal regulation, was the only thing that offered him a relief. I know what that's like. I wish my dad would have done it, but my dad was somebody who was, uh, he worked on the psych ward, and he saw every time... Uh, Somebody took a drug and they had a bad reaction to it. He saw it. And to him, marijuana was akin to heroin. So it was impossible to get him to try it. And unfortunately, you know, degenerative disc disease ruined his life, and he never once took a smoke of anything. He says, marijuana has many uses. I have fibromyalgia pain in my arm, and the only thing that offers any relief is marijuana. They're talking about kids who have grand mal seizures, and they've discovered that marijuana eases that down to where the children can have a life. That right there, to me, says legalize it across the board. Also, a lot of the people that are fixed from seizures on this are done from a kind of marijuana that does not have uh, a lot of THC in it. It's the other compounds in marijuana that have actually been found to help seizures. Also, look up how well, um, oh, help me, uh, hemp oil girl did. We had her on the Media Speaks a couple of years ago, and she was supposed to already be dead. She's been doing hemp oil, and I've heard that she has had some trouble, but she was supposed to be long dead. Uh, she's out driving around perfectly okay, at least the last I've heard. Things may have gone south since. But I can tell you for sure that she was supposed to be long dead, and she was enjoying pretty much a pain-free life, living just like you and me when she was supposed to be dead because of a, uh, a, a hemp oil. Look up hemp oil, girl. You'll find her. It says, Freeman also compared authorities' lax attitude toward the counterculture hippies of the Woodstock era with the events that occurred at the less drug-addled festival 30 years later, which resulted in riots, bonfires, and overall chaos. Well, I don't know that a bonfire is bad, but yeah, they had a lot of trouble with the new Woodstock in 99 compared to 69, when it was more about drinking than it was about weed. He's right there. 23 states in the District of Columbia currently have laws legalizing marijuana in some form, reports governing.com, adding that four states have also legalized the herb for recreational use. Legalization activists lauded the DEA head Michelle Lionert's resignation last month, hoping her departure will leave the door open for national marijuana reform. It has. Uh, the, the new uh, DEA is not, uh, head is not going after weed. It was announced today. He's really going to lay off weed and focus on harder drugs, which, again, is good news and bad news because it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem, which is that it's up to man and God. It's between man and God, I should say, what as someone puts in their body, not the government. If you harm somebody while you're on a drug, we already have laws against that. So the DEA is moving in the right direction, but they clearly have a long way to go. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Two stories left, some amazing good news for a change, and, of course, the dumdy of the day. But I want to give a shout-out, if I could, to change a taxi. If you're in Canton, Ohio, or if you were within about a 50 to 100-mile radius of it, find out how much your local transportation, cab, jitney, Uber, whatever is going to cost you, and call Change Taxi. You can find them at Facebook.com, Change Taxi, trans, Change Transportation, excuse me. Compare it against your taxi companies, and I tell you what, I bet you he beats it. Even Uber, I bet you he beats it. Friends, um, moving on from Change Transportation to Reuters here, this is really good news. Uh, just like the DEA hasn't necessarily gone far enough, it could be argued that Kraft has not gone far enough on this. But this is good news, and at least since uh, Christelle is not going to have a cell phone after the EMP, oh, I'm going to love it so much. I'll have my girlfriend back. 
Uh, but because she's not going to have a cell phone, she's going to eat her favorite, which is, of course, Kraft. And uh, even Kraft Velveeta, listen to this. We're removing synthetic colors from iconic macaroni and cheese. Now, I'm not sure this means there's not going to be GMO death in it, but I'm pretty sure a Kraft also has an organic Kraft. I could be wrong on that. Christelle would know. She's a shopper. But uh, um, I know that every step that we take away from these sorts of things is, in fact, a step in the right direction. If it's all organic, I don't care if my cheese is blue. I really don't. Please don't diet. Kraft Foods Group, Inc. on Monday said it's revamping its family-friendly macaroni and cheese meal, removing synthetic colors and preservatives from the popular boxed dinner. The move comes at a time when Kraft is battling sluggish demand as consumers shift to brands that are perceived as healthier, including foods that are organic and less processed. And I've explained to you that this is the difference between a healthy life and a sick life. It's that simple. And I eat way too much fast food. I had McDonald's and Taco Bell today. I also take uh, a Mao, I take like 12 vitamins a day. My only real bad habit is fast food, and a lot of it has to do with the hours I work. I come home after seven and a half hours, and I do this show. I'm really not in the mood to cook. It says the company has been targeted by consumer advocacy groups. The groups have pressured Kraft to remove artificial food dyes from its products complaining that the additives are not used and in some cases banned in other countries. Kraft spokesman Lynn Galea said the changes were being made to address concerns expressed by consumers, including demands for an improved nutrition and simpler ingredients. Indeed, why, why do we need to eat dye, number, color, whatever? Why? Why do we need that? And again, it's not like I'm a hypocrite here eating all the fast food in the world. I actually like fast food. What angers me are the things that they do to it. So every step in the direction of a more organic, less processed, less artificially colored food is great news for me. It says, we know parents want to feel good about the foods they eat and serve to their families. What about the rest of the damn family? When it's for the children. Galia said, uh, and this was in an email, um, she said the changes would be effective January 2016 for original Kraft macaroni and cheese in the U.S. The company is also removing synthetic colors by the end of 2016 in Canada for the Kraft Dinner original. So that, friends, is wonderful news. Again, it doesn't get rid of all GMOs, but if you keep pushing them, it looks like they're a company that's willing to listen. And I've said for a long time, the easy fix for McDonald's and all of these places is to offer both inorganic and non-inorganic. And then ultimately, leave the decision up to the people that are buying it. If you want to spend more money for the, um, the healthier organic burger at McDonald's, then you're going to go ahead and you're going to order that delicious burger. If you don't have a lot of money or you're really not that worried about it or you believe the GMO lies, well, you know what? I just said you should legalize weed as long as you're not cross-pollinating. I don't care what you eat, really. By cross-pollinating, I mean ruining the organic crops. I don't care. But I think you should have the option, and I think they'd find that a lot of people would, in fact, choose organic. And that, friends, brings us to the dum dee dum dee dum dee of the day. Oh, yeah, there's our dum dee music coming at you here. Oh, yeah, the dum dee of the day. What is the dum dee of the day? I'm going to let the music play in the background here so uh, we can get the full effect of said dumdy. Truth revolt. Boston UF, U professor, white masculinity is the problem for America's colleges. You know what this is about, right? And I'm going to be covering the Mad Max movie um, this weekend on the Media Speaks for the entertainment section because I went to see Mad Max and I hadn't thought of this. I had mentioned that Max didn't have a real big role in it. No spoilers coming. I hate when people do that. But I will say that the guy that played Max did a fair enough job, but he was not the lead character. It was more like Charlize Theron was, uh, the, the lady from Monster. Well, it was kind of a feminism plot. I didn't really catch it. I don't go to the movies for that. I go to the movies to get away from all this. But I can kind of see it now that now that it was mentioned to me. Maybe I'm trying to find something now that just because they said it, I don't know. But I do know it was all about this, like, trying to save these women and that. Um, I, I don't see the feminism in it the way that some people did because they were all scantily dressed and stuff. So maybe not. 
But my point being that all things women and all things anti-men are being driven home to intimidate men to accept Hillary Clinton. That's exactly what happens. We've had a feminism for how many decades now? It's being driven in a hyper speed here, paving the way for Hillary so that if you don't support her policies, they're going to turn you into anti-woman. And this is insanity, friends. If you fall for this, dum 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 for you. Sadia Grundy, a sociology and African American studies professor at Boston U, recently declared that white masculinity is the problem for America's colleges. That's right. Despite the attack on white college males, whom she called a problem population, the university has stood behind the newly hired professor, defending the openly hostile statements against the large segment of the student population as free speech. You know what? I would agree that it is free speech. And if some bonehead who I would not support said that about black people, he would be fired. And I think it, it, if you're going to honor one person, you'd have to honor the other. Um, no, I don't believe that uh, black people are a uh, problem population, but I'm saying if it was said in was reverse order, I wonder if the person would still have the job. White masculinity isn't a problem for America's college. White masculinity is the problem for America's college, tweeted Grundy in March. Yeah, white masculinity is the problem. How many, and answer me, how many of you are buried in student loan debt? How many of you have kids that you're trying to pay for to go to college? The price of the institutional education is not the problem. The whole problem is white masculinity. You, are you working two jobs trying to get through school? Maybe you're awful at math and you're, you're oh my God, you don't know how you're going to work and make enough money on your minimum wage job to still be able to pass this trig class. Don't worry. That's not the problem. White masculinity is the problem in college. The problem. My God, this woman shouldn't be allowed to teach a dog disobedience school. It says the tweet was similar to another in which she described white males as a problem population on campuses. Why is white America so reluctant to identify white college males as the problem population, she asked. This doesn't make any sense at all. I've never seen a problem population of any color in college. And it took me a very long time to get my degree because I was working through it and only taking three classes at a time. There was no problem population, be they black, white, oriental, or otherwise. There was no. We're not looking for a problem po population here. There wasn't one. In January, Grundy declared that she regularly conducts a personal boycott against white-owned businesses. Every MLK week, she says, I commit myself to not spending a dime in white-owned businesses, and every year I find it nearly impossible. Well, I bet she drives all over to find stores that are only owned by African Americans, of course, buying more gas than she would normally to support the people like Boko Haram, who are rampaging Africa and stealing the price of gasoline, working with ISIS to get gas in ways that are stolen so that we consume more gas so that she doesn't have to shop at a white, because she hates white people. So, you know, support, support you know, drilling, support uh, the oil industry, do anything you can. And again, this is coming from somebody who burns more gas than anyone that's ever lived. The point is, I don't burn gas just for the hell of it, because I want to pick a certain race that I don't like so I can burn as much gas out of my car as I can, and then blame the white man. I bet this don't believes in global warming, too. How much you want to bet this fool believes in global warming? Another controversial series of tweets argued that white people invented race-based slavery. Deal with your white shit, white people. Slavery is y'all thing, she wrote. Y'all thing? I don't know a single white person who wants to own a slave. If anything, I know white people who are just as nowhere stuck at their dead-end job as I do black people. And I think if the two people got together and realized that everything that you have said, Grundy, is wrong, and started focusing on things that were right, we would be able to solve a lot of these problems without creating a problem population myth. 
FoxNews.com notes that the tweets were first highlighted by Uni of Massachusetts student Nick Pappas, who posted them on the website SoCollege, C-A-W-L-E-G-E dot com, who wrote, You have to teach college-aged white males eventually, no? This seems like you are unqualified to grade their work, as you clearly demonstrate some kind of special bias against them, asked Pappas in the blog. I guess that's not really an ask, but that's what it says. And I've been through this. I had a very anti-Christian English teacher who gave me a B on an A paper simply because it proved the resurrection of Christ without using the Bible to do it. If you want to know how I did it, go to Amazon.com uh, Kindle House. Sam Beganji, and it's called, uh, guess what? The historicity is the resurrection of Christ. The research online since the story broke has been less than kind to Grundy. I wonder why. Despite the blowback, however, Boston U is supporting the recently hired professor. Uh, uni spokesman Colin Riley said, Professor Grundy is exercising her right to free speech, and we respect her right to do so. I don't have a problem with that. My point is that, uh, again, as mentioned here, Fox News quotes Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, Robert Shibley, who argued that while freedom of speech should be defended, the, uni, the university is demonstrating its hypocrisy by unevenly applying its own policies for students banning expressions of bigotry, hatred, and intolerance, and statements not made in good taste and decency. So it is against their rules. The university, uh, Schnibli contended, <coughs> excuse me, should eliminate these policies so that if you can defend every student and faculty member, it's free speech rights. This is uh, from Horowitz, he, he mentioned, David Horowitz. I'm not surprised that Boston University is hiring a racist to teach African American studies. Anti-white racism is rampant in black studies programs, which are generally indoctrination programs in left-wing politics. If she were a white racist rather than an anti-white racist, she would never have gotten hired. Professors are supposed to be experts in some scholarly field and professionals in their classroom discourse. They don't have a license to indoctrinate students in their prejudices, whether these injustices are right or left. So there you go. The dumdy of the day uh, going to this Grundy monster who is just stirring up racism instead of helping students realize that our problem is not skin-based. It's just about everything else. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGangie doing political commentary for the Media Speaks, signing off. Remember, you can donate to the show at thecorrectviews at hotmail.com. Every single penny that you give to me goes towards a better show, friends. Good night. God bless.